Hello there, this is chapter 22, Toxicological Emergencies. So some quick terminology, a poison is something that a person is exposed to in various quantities, uh, which turns into a toxin in the bloodstream, which ultimately damages you know, major organs, which usually leads to the person's death. Uh, antidote is something that we can provide to to stop this process, to stop the poison from entering the bloodstream or to neutralize it in some way. And of course, an overdose is someone taking too much of something for some reason. It's important to differentiate that because, you know, there are people who accidentally overdose on things and there are people who, of course, do it on purpose, either for recreational issues or they want to commit suicide. So you need to you know, make sure you understand what's going on on the call. So there's various ways that a person is exposed to a poison or a toxin. And the first one, the most common one, is ingestion. And what's good about ingestion, if you think about like you've had breakfast this morning, and by the time you ingested your breakfast to the time it actually, the nutrients and the sugars got into your bloodstream, it was probably about 60 minutes. So what's nice about this is if someone ingests something either on purpose or, or by mistake, if they call 911 quickly and you get there, in a timely manner, it gives them a much better chance of survival because more than likely the toxin or the poison has not gotten into their bloodstream yet. So there's, there's quite a bit of, of delay. You would need to, of course, ask them, you know, what did you take? Why did you take it? How much did you take? And, of course, you'd want to see the, the product, the, the, the label, the, the container, whatever they might have ingested. Now, inhalation is still very pop popular. This is, this is usually by huffing. And people huff all kinds of stuff, you know, all different kinds of paint, carburetor cleaner I've seen, uh, you know, uh, even like all, all, just all kinds of things they huff. The big danger here is unlike ingestion, uh, inhalation, it absorbs into the bloodstream fast, within seconds. If you put a plastic bag over your head filled with, you know, paint, and you take a big old deep breath, it gets into your bloodstream, it gets to your brain within you know, 20 or 30 seconds. If you go unconscious and you got this bag over your head, you're going to suffocate to death. And of course, if there is or there are you know, sprays or chemicals in the air, EMS shows up, you know, we can be exposed as well. So primarily is you know, get the bag off their head and they're going to need bag valve mass ventilations. They're going to need obviously ABC support. Now, injection, uh, the most common is some type of opioid. It could be fentanyl, it could be heroin, it could be a mixture, just all different combinations of this. Um, they also inject amphetamines and just a wide variety of stuff. Ultimately, if it's, if it's injected intravenously, it's a very, very rapid effect. So they inject it within seconds, they feel the euphoria, they feel the injection. And they can rapidly go unconscious, and if it's an overdose, and they can rapidly stop breathing within seconds as well. Now, absorption, this is through the skin. This is transdermal through the skin. And you look at this guy right here. He's working at a nursery. Um, he's probably in, out in the sun lifting these heavy bags of lime around. He's probably sweaty and all that. For those of you, those of you who don't know what lime is, it's actually a soil conditioner. And if you mix it with water, it, it heats up. So he's been sweating, he's got, you know, mucus in his nose, he has, he has oral secretions, he has, he has oral sec his, his secretions in his lungs, all liquids essentially. So if he gets this on his skin, it's going to burn really badly. And if he gets it into his nose, his mouth, his trachea, his bronchial tubes, it's going to burn his airway. So it's a big risk for these people. It's also a risk for us as well. You wouldn't want to approach this person and start like, you know, brushing away the dust because, you know, guess what's going to happen to you. So, you know, this is the individual you're going to have to have them, you know, stand back, have them take their clothes off, get a garden hose. Luckily, you're at a nursery, get a garden hose and you're going to have to uh, wash away that dust. Now, when it comes to treating uh, chemicals, so if you have chemicals on someone's skin, if it's a dry chemical, you would like to brush away as much as you can before you flush. If it's a liquid chemical, then you just flush with copious amounts of water. 
So scene size up. So I, like I mentioned, when we first met on that first day, you know, our scene size up, our, you know, our patient assessment starts when we arrive at scene, when we can first see the patient. So you're looking for things, clues of what's going on. You see the needles in the tray right there. You smell vomitous. There's empty bottles of poisons around, alcohol around. There's drug paraphernalia. There's strong smells of chemicals in the air. Obvious signs that, you know, of what might be going on here. Now, the big thing for me is the primary assessment, because if you think about it, you know, you think about the patient who, is in, who has ingested a poison, it takes, you know, 35, 45, 50 minutes, an hour for that poison to get into their bloodstream and start to affect their central nervous system. So if this person, you know, ingested or, or has been exposed to a poison and you arrive on scene and they're still fully awake and alert, their vital signs are stable, their skins are normal, their breathing is great, their blood pressure is you know, wonderful and all that great stuff. It tells you right then and there that even though they ingested something or they were exposed to something, it has not gotten into their bloodstream yet in enough quantity to affect their central nervous system. So we're kind of ahead of the curve. Now this is the person that if, if it is a pill or some type of ingested chemi chemical, uh, in, in some cases the charcoal, might work for them. And there's tons and tons of, of, of antidotes at the emergency room. They, can, they can work for all different kinds of other things as well. Our secondary really revolves around the history, like what did you take? Why did you take it? How much did you take? A good sample history is like what kind of medications are you on? Are there, are there, any, are there any interactions between the poison or toxin or chemical they took and that particular medication possibly? something, you know, uh, synergetic or something like that. Um, also, what their history is like. If this person says I, says, I have high cholesterol and I have, you know, diabetes and hypertension, I had three heart attacks before, I've had two strokes before, he's got this really long history, he's, he might be more prone to be, you know, worse off by taking this or ingesting or being exposed to this chemical. And, of course, treatment is going to be, you've already treated the ABCs in the primary assessment, you know, now you're watching the ABCs, you're monitoring the airway, the breathing, and of course you're treating as, you know, as you find. Uh, activated charcoal. So uh, this, of course, is a national registry drug. Uh, EMTs in the, in the state of California cannot administer this drug. Uh, but you, you need to know for testing purposes, you need to know the indications, the actions, the contraindications, the dose, and the side effects and all that. Just as a reminder, the dose Activated charcoal is, is one gram per kilogram of body weight, up to 100 grams for adults. Types of poisoning. So carbon monoxide poisoning is fairly common. Uh, carbon monoxide is a byproduct of incomplete combustion of a hydrocarbon. So this would be your, you know, the get the, your gasoline or diesel car, a house on, that's on fire, your fire pit, your gas stove, all those sources of energy release carbon monoxide as a byproduct. If you're in an enclosed space and you're breathing in carbon monoxide in high enough concentrations, it starts to strip the uh, oxygen molecules off of the red blood cells and replaces them. So this person now cannot, even though he's got oxygen in, in his bloodstream, he cannot use that oxygen as, as, as an energy source. And this is what people eventually die from. Signs and symptoms. So mild states of, of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, headache is usually the predominant complaint. They have a headache, they feel a little nauseated, maybe a little bit dizzy. As they get more and more exposed to the carbon monoxide, they become confused, uh, disoriented, they go unconscious eventually. And if no one intercedes, if no one gets them out of the environment and provides it with high flow too and all that, uh, eventually they'll die from, from basically from starvation of oxygen to their cells. Um, and of course, uh, their skin will turn a bright cherry red color because that's the color of carbon monoxide uh, when it's in your bloodstream. So treatment is, you know, get them out of the environment as rapidly as possible. High flow oxygen, you know, bag valve mask or just via mask. And then, of course, if and this is County of San Diego policy S-134, if they are unresponsive or they're pregnant, you should consider having them transported down to the higher barrack chamber 
in Hillcrest um, to let them wash out that that carbon monoxide. Uh, cyanide. So cyanide, um, the places where I've had patients are primarily industrial. This is like a like a, a chrome plating plant. They they plate they plate chrome, you know, like car pieces. Uh, certain photography places use it. And what's good about all this is if you do go to an industrial site that has had a cyanide release, and there are people that are victims, federal law says these businesses have to have the antidote kit on site, and they have to have people on site, employees, that know how to use it. So when, by the time you arrive, if, if you're lucky, they're already starting to, in, there's a couple of in, injections, I think there's one medication by inhalation, and just let them continue whatever protocol they are going to follow, just let them do that first. You also have, you know, the, the hazmat side of this as well, because this person does have maybe liquid cyanide on them. If they have enough cyanide in their body, they can actually off-gas cyanide through their pores, which makes them basically a, a, a hazmat incident. And how cyanide kills you is basically by not letting your cells use the oxygen. Uh, it blocks the, uh, the cell's ability to use oxygen, so it causes the cellular hypoxia, which eventually leads to death if it's not somehow, you know, taken care of. Let's talk about drug and alcohol emergencies. So scene size up wise. So all I got to say about this is do not stereotype people. Don't walk up and go, oh yeah, he's just drunk. Like this guy right here, he's got this you know, four or five beer bottles around him. He looks a little disheveled. He looks a little drunk. Oh yeah, it's just Bob again. He's had his five beers. He's drunk. The big problem with this is, is that because a lot of these people who are alcoholics and even the people who are just party drinkers, uh, they can have other medical problems. They can have histories of seizures. They can be diabetics. They can maybe have, have struck their head yesterday. They, they got drunk yesterday, hit their head, and now they're having a bleed going on inside their cranial vault, which is leading to a disorientation kind of presentation. Uh, there are some strokes and seizures who make the people appear to be intoxicated. So you got to rule out the medical stuff first. And once you've ruled out, okay, it's, it's, I've taken a blood sugar. There's no signs of trauma. I, I, there's, no, you know, there's no blood in his mouth. There's no urine like he peed on himself. It's probably not a seizure. And you know, those types of things, you rule out these things. Now you can say, okay, he's just really intoxicated to the point where he can't walk. At this, and he has to go to the hospital. Um, and watch for weapons. All these people have, they carry you know, knives and primarily knives, like folding knives or even, you know, even like the, even the big knives as well. Uh, you know, disarm them, have the officers do it. I wouldn't go digging in their pockets. Uh, if, they, if there's a cop at scene, let them put on their leather gloves and let them go through their pockets. It's probably safer for you. Now, if you do encounter someone who is under the influence of drugs or alcohol, a lot of times they can be agitated. They can, they can feel paranoid. Um, and so they might perceive you as a threat. Now, if the patient is lucid enough, even though they might be angry and posturing and saying things, you know, that is, appear aggressive, um, as long as you stand back about 10 or 15 feet and start talking to them, you got to remember people who are that are, who are on drugs and alcohol, they have this really big personal space, like really big personal space, like at least 10, 12 feet. So approach them, get about 10 feet away and say, hey, I'm John. I'm here to help you. I'm an EMT. Hey, your friends over there, they said that you're not feeling well because you took this medication. Well, I just want to let you know that, you know, it's going to wear off. You're going to feel better later. Can you, do, you, do you mind talking to me? Once they start talking to you, even though they might still appear angry, you know, talk to them, explain in a calm voice and, and maybe, you know, hey, can I come and can I take your pulse? Can I take your blood pressure? Can we talk about this? And it's going to be your choice. I mean, if you if you don't feel like you're building a kind of rapport with them and they're not they're not really cooperating, then I would back away and I would then think about restraints and police officers and firefighters and that kind of thing. Now, this talk down technique does not work on people who are agitated, uh, especially if someone who's on PCP or they have they have agitated delirium. Uh, usually from, from like a methamphetamine or an amphetamine product. These people will have a disassociation. 
So they're in, where they're in a, a delirious state or delirium. Uh, and what happens is that they, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know where they are. And you cannot reason with these people. The, those people, you're just going to have to restrain them as safely as possible. You need lots of people to do this. You know, don't, if just you and your partner, do not try to restrain someone. Call the police, get a fire truck there, get another ambulance there, get a supervisor there. You need at least five, six, even seven people to safely restrain someone like this. Alcohol syndrome. So there's this uh, syndrome called the Renicki Korsakoff syndrome. And uh, basically what happens is, is over time of years and years of alcohol consumption, uh, the brain starts to shrink and kind of misfire. The cells get damaged. And it leads to this early onset dementia. So this person is disoriented. They don't know where they are. It's the same dementia, essentially, sort of, that old people get, but it's in your 40s or 50s or something like that. And a lot of times we don't get, you know, called out for an alcoholic because they're drunk or, or that they're withdrawing from their alcohol. We get called out for the other reasons, things like they have liver disease, they have, you know, they have uh, abdominal pain, they have ascites developing from their liver disease, uh, they have diabetic issues, they have malnutrition issues because they, they drink their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They don't eat, they get ulcers and all those. So, you know, we might get called out not for the obvious, the alcoholism, we might get called out for the secondary illnesses associated with that. Now, uh, when someone does stop drinking, so the people who are alcoholics and they might want to clear, you know, clean themselves up possibly they want to get back to their family they want to get a job again they want to they want to change their life around the problem is is that they they don't go to a clinic they don't go to a doctor to do this they try to do it themselves so usually within about 12 to 24 hours after their last drink they start feeling the effects of the withdrawals now you can read through your book your your, your chapter there's four stages of withdrawals so Usually we encounter these people in stage one, and this is when they're getting the early symptoms. Their, their hands are shaking, they have abdominal pain, they're sweating, uh, they, might, they, they, they might feel anxious because they're in a lot of discomfort, and that's why they call us. They're completely oriented, their vital signs are, are pretty much stable, maybe a little higher than normal heart rate, but otherwise pretty normal. Um, they basically need a ride to the hospital to see a physician to, clear, to try to clear this up anyway. Uh, rarely do we encounter them in their, this, the second stage is when they're, they're beginning to hallucinate, they're seeing things, they're smelling things, they're, they're, they, they have auditory and they have you know, visual hallucinations. And the third stage is the big concern for us because the third stage, uh, at least at this point anyway, they can go into seizures. The problem with this, this list, this, you know, this uh, stage one, two, three, and four, is a lot of times people react differently to their withdrawals. I've seen people 12 hours into their into their process who have seizures, and there are people that never have seizures. So I always ask the patient, you know, are you, have you been through this before? Have you ever had a seizure? Oh yeah, I've had a couple of seizures. And these are the really bad seizures you learned about in your seizure lecture. This is the status epileptic seizure. This is the one that seizes and seizes and seizes and continues to seize for 20 and 30 and 40 minutes. And this is the true life-threatening seizure. Now, um, the fourth and final stage is the person going through the, the, the DTs. So when they go through the d delirium tremens, uh, the big concern is, is they will start to have an altered mental status. They can have these massive seizures, which leads to hyperthermia, which leads to acidosis, which leads to heart failure, and you know they, they can die from this. So delirium tremens is a true life-threatening uh, condition and needs to be treated rapidly. Luckily for us as EMS personnel, we rarely ever encounter people deeply into the DTs. I have seen them with seizures, uh, and we were able to stop the seizures. At least you know as a medic, I can provide that. But if they're seizing, that's a true life-threatening situation. Let's talk about drugs. Now, there's, there's four you know, basic categories of drugs that we encounter out in the field. I mean, there's millions of drugs out there, and I can't keep track of them all, in all honesty. 
Uh, but stimulants, depressants, um, some kind of hallucinogenic, you know, so like uh, acid or something like that, mescaline, and and uh, that ketamine is is a disassociative. So those are the, the four that you know that we encounter, and a lot of these are mixed together. Remember, people who take drugs drink alcohol, and they they don't just take one drug; they take you know other two, three, four of the drugs. They try to balance them out. You know, they take they, they take an amphetamine and then they take a depressant to kind of create some kind of balance in their, you know, drug taking. Go figure. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the amphetamine products. Um, methamphetamines, amphetamines, cocaine, those types of things. They cause increased heart rate, excitability, agitation, uh, rapid breathing, and all that. The biggest problem with this is it raises their metabolism and it causes them to become hyperthermic, uh, even to the point where I've, I've, I've had people who are severely into meth and their, their core temperature is like 105 degree core temperature, which is, you know, near, pretty much near brain damage time in a lot of cases. Uh, they can also get massive seizures from these. And again, you have, the, you have the same problem is you get this severe hyperthermia, you get the acidosis, uh, you get the, this massive dopamine and catecholamine release and they have these seizures and they can go into cardiac arrest because of this hyperthermia. So we're really going to be rapidly cooling them down with ice packs and air conditioning and fanning and all that in the back of the ambulance. They're probably going to be restrained at this point anyway. Uh, and then rapid transport to the hospital. Keep an eye on them. They do so will suddenly stop moving and they'll go into cardiac arrest. So if you have a patient in the back of your ambulance, you have them restrained to the gurney, and they're fighting the restraints, and they're moving around, and suddenly they stop, and they go, they get relaxed. They're probably died. So you guys get the idea. Have fun. Uh, opioids. So this is heroin and fentanyl. But remember, you know, and I'm sure some of you have broke your arm or your leg or something, and they gave you a, a prescription for Tylenol twos or or whatever they might have given you, some kind of prescription narcotics. They all do the same thing, whether they're, they're synthetic or whether they're natural. They all do kind of the same thing. Um, they're a depressant. They're a CNS depressant. So their breathing becomes really slow and ineffective. They become sleepy. They go unresponsive. Their pupils become pinpoint. Um, and this is why we usually get called. Uh, treatment, of course, is always start out with BLS first. So ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, suction, BVM ventilation, OPA, NPA, more than likely in this case, I would go with the nasal pharyngeal airway and then a bag valve mask. And of course, at some point after you've established their airway and you've protected their airway, then you go with the Narcan uh, internasally. Um, you know, rave parties, they're, they're still around even though they probably don't call them that anymore. But ecstasy is still a very popular medication out there. Um, it has a kind of a mixture of of an amphetamine product with with also an hallucinogenic as well. Uh, if you mix ecstasy with alcohol, it's kind of a really bad mixture. And the biggest risk is hyperthermia. Hyperthermia is the biggest problem with these, especially if they're if they're if they're dancing, you know, one of these parties, they're jumping around, and they're getting dehydrated. They're not, they're not drinking enough water. They can become grossly uh, hypo. Uh, they can grossly uh, hyperthermic and dehydrated. So rapid cooling measures, ABCs, restraints, because they'll be disoriented, they'll be combative more than likely. Uh, and then to the nearest, you know, hospital or paramedics, so they can start IVs and give them uh, fluids. Uh, there's a bunch of other drugs out there. PCP has come back in the last few years, and uh, this is a disassociative uh, hallucinogenic. It makes people just feel like they're Superman. They can. I've seen people like break plate glass windows with their fists and this stuff. And uh, I, I, one guy in particular, I called him Rambo. I, I gave him a nickname Rambo because he was like nuts. It took 10 people to hold him down and he was like throwing police officers off of him like they were like dolls because he just, they don't feel pain. They feel super strong and you, you can't, this is, you can't talk to them. You can't reason with them. Uh, GHB is still around. Um, different names out there. You know, essentially, it's a depressant. It can also cause disassociation as well. If you mix it with alcohol, it makes it worse. Um, they can kind of look like zombies sometimes, stagger around. They, 
and they, they, you can't really talk to them. They're usually not violent. They're almost like, again, like they're kind of like staggering around. They're kind of slow and all that. And they can go unconscious and they can stop breathing, especially if it's mixed with alcohol, which it usually is. Uh, ketamine, special K, has been around a long time. It's a disassociative and it just makes you not care. Uh, but there's a lot of you know bad side effects, especially if it's mixed with other drugs. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what's going on. They can walk out into the street in front of a car. And, you know, there's still a lot of prescription medications out there uh, and the over-the-counter medications. Uh, you know, DXM, that's, you know, that's uh, like, you know, cough and cold stuff. Uh, that can cause, that's a depressant as well. That can make you stop breathing if you drink enough of it. Uh, Benadryl, you know, it's a common over-the-counter drug. It can lead to all kinds of terrible things. It can lead to agitation. It can lead to un unconsciousness. You can stop breathing. Uh, even Neurontin, which is a nerve medication, people people take it for various uh, various nerve conditions, including seizures. Uh, people overdose on Neurontin, and it, it kind of gives them an kind of gives them um, kind of a I won't say out of body experience, but like like hallucinations. So that's being abused now as well. So pretty much any drug out there, whether it's a drug or a medication, can be abused to the point of some kind of you know recreational effects. And marijuana, go figure on this one, huh? So um, marijuana now, or, you know, THC, or whatever you want, cannabis, I guess, if you want to be the, you know, whatever. Um, the problem now is these these things are so, so hybridized, and they're so strong that people don't know how to use this stuff. So it's not usually, it's not usually the, the person who buys, you know, a joint and smokes a joint. Uh, it's the person who ingests uh, the the THC. So someone who eats the edibles, the candies, the brownies, the tea. Um, like for instance, I had, I had a guy that he went to a you know one of the can the, the, the cannabis out, out outlets and he bought a I think it was a um, a, a fifty mil a fifty milligram uh, brownie, and it says right on the package you cut it up into ten pieces, take one in you know, one piece at a time. Well, apparently what happened to him is he took a couple pieces, he didn't feel any effects, so he, he ate the whole thing. So within you know 10 minutes, he ate 50 milligrams of THC. So by the time, within about an hour, he was completely out of control. Uh, heart rate was 180, breathing rapidly, paranoid, hyperactivity. He thought he was going to die. I think he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die, am I going to die? And I wanted to say, yes, you're going to die. But of course, you know, I wouldn't want to say that. Unfortunately, you know, we have no antidote for this. Uh, take him to the hospital, explain what's going on. Um, and people don't understand the, how strong this stuff is. And, and of course, you know, the regular users, we never see those people. It's usually the people that this is the first time they've done it or they're not used to doing it and they take way too much. And it's uh, the end. It's party time.